All right. Let's sing. Amen. Welcome to the uh, evening worship service at Temple Heights Baptist Church. Let's open our hymnals to number 30 if you need it. How majestic is your name? How majestic is your name? blessings, your fresh blessings upon us this evening as we gather together in your blessed name. Lord, may each hymn just uh, touch our hearts and draw us closer to you. And as we read the scriptures, Lord, may we hear your voice speaking to us individually. May your Holy Spirit minister to our spirit, drawing us ever so closer to you, Lord. We pray for those that watch from the internet, from afar. We pray that it will be just as much as a blessing to them. Lord, we ask it all in Jesus' precious name. Amen and amen. amen. All right, Miss Chris is going to love me here. What? You love me, don't you? <laughs> she doesn't say she loves me, she says what? Um, I wrote out the songs for this evening and I never follow the script. Guys, you know that. Okay, so which one are we doing? We're, we're, we're going to do number 132. I don't know why, but I want to sing a Christmas song. Okay, that's what I mean. Christmas song. Angels we have heard on Sunday.
He's coming again. So I kind of wanted to go in that. That's what popped into my head. Right. Now the question is, what's next, Miss Chris? <laughs> 332. I'll stick back to the script. Come back into, I'll get rain back in. Number 332, without him. Without him. personal praise unto God. You're, you're Amen. Amen. I'd like you to open your Bibles. We've been studying a lot of the parables, and I know we've been tying that with prayer. And you say, how are you going to tie 
these parables with prayer. I'll show you at the end, but um, I'd like you to look in Luke chapter 15. In Luke chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Luke 15, 1 through 10. I, I like to hear great preachers. I like to, all my life I've been enamored by good preaching. And uh, I noticed that some of the best preachers are storytellers. That's what Jesus was. He was a storyteller. And so, if any young man here, any person, God calls you to preach, the best way to preach is follow Jesus' example. Amen. Amen. Follow Jesus' example. Chapter 15, verses 1 through 10. Then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man received sinners, receiveth sinners, and he is with them. And he spake this parable unto them, saying, What man of you have a hundred sheep? If he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness, and go after that which is lost until he find it? And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he re cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep, which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven over one sinner that repenteth more than other over nineteen and nine just persons which need no repentance. Either that woman having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. Let's pray. Lord, I ask your blessings on uh, this message. We've heard this story uh, many, many times countless times there are songs been written about it of the lost sheep and the ninety and nine and father I, I pray that I will do the message justice tonight and I can only do that Lord with your Holy Spirit in me and so I ask Lord that you would fill me afresh with the power of your Holy Spirit may you work in me and through me to the hearts of everyone here may we see the simplicity of the message but at the same time the profundity of the message lord we'll praise you for what you do in these next moments in jesus precious name amen <clears throat> every one of us were empty and lost and void and without life and like this lost sheep before we came to christ this, um, we find this parable that Jesus spoke unto all the people here. He used things that people could refer to. There were a lot of shepherds during Jesus' time. And so he would use things that they could, they could uh, 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 equate to. And here we find, but first of all, as I was getting into the parable, uh, the Lord showed me something in verse 1 and 2. Believe it or not, and this is a warning for us. It's a warning for us. Say, what is that, Pastor? He says, well, then drew near unto him all the publicans and sinners for to hear him. He had great popularity. His uh, signs and wonders and miracles were drawing great crowds. 
and the words he spoke, no one ever spoke like Jesus. When he spoke, people listened. Amen? And uh, it says here in verse 2, here's the warning, folks. And the Pharisees and scribes murmured, saying, This man receiveth sinners and eateth with them. You say, well, what message is that for us, Pastor? Well, we know the word. We've heard it time and time again. May God help us to not be just like the religious crowd that pointed their fingers and judged. May we be full of love and not point fingers at anyone. People are going to come to church that don't think just like you do. And we pray that God will bring in new people. And these new people, they're not going to be just walk the way you walk. And they won't talk the way you talk. Some of them will be young. Maybe some of them will have tattoos. You never know. Maybe some of them will even have some piercings. What are you going to say about that? We should not judge. I remember once I read a portion of Billy Graham. I've, uh, the more I read about his life, the more I respect him. Uh, he didn't get bent out of shape at all of the criticism. And he was criticized a lot. He never got bent out of shape. You'll notice that Billy Graham never spoke back to those that spoke ill of him. Never. I can never recall anything of Billy Graham biting back at those that bit at him. And he said this once. It's God's, it's God's work to judge. It's the Holy Spirit to convict. It's my job to love. Whew. Boy, that's something to think about. Amen? God is the judge. We are not the judge. We learn things. We learn. We can read the Bible. We can know it through and through. We can read it. I, I have a friend of mine that read the Bible through every three months. He's a pastor. Notice I said he was a pastor. He fell into sin. He's no longer a pastor. What use was it for him to read the Bible through every three months? I've never read the Bible through every three months. I'm good if, you know, in the 53 years I've been a preacher, I've read the Bible through probably about, about 20 to 25 times. I never counted it per se. But some people have pride in, I've read the Bible through again. Here I go. That's fine. But let's not be judgmental. Amen. I would rather, instead of you reading three or four chapters a day, just to keep up with the quota, to read several verses and really absorb those verses and make them part of your life than just read through the Bible just per se. Really? I think so. Amen. May God help us to not be like the scribes and Pharisees. And Jesus began to speak in verse 3. And he spake this parable unto them. The parable was a little story. We know that it was an earthly story with spiritual connotation. And we entitled this, we, Jesus didn't even give it a title, but we have given it the title, the, uh, the lost sheep or the 90 and 9, right? We've heard it in songs and so forth. <coughs> he says, what man of you... Having a hundred sheep, if he lose one of them, doth not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after that which is lost until he find it. 
And when he hath found it, he layeth it on his shoulders and rejoiceth. And when he cometh home, he calleth together his friends and neighbors and, and uh, saying unto them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say unto you that likewise joy shall be in heaven for one sinner that repenteth more than ninety and nine just persons which need no repentance. I had a preacher visit us when we were on the other side of the river. He was one of the stunt artists for Chuck Norris. And he's a Christian. Chuck Norris, by the way, is a devout Christian. And this young man who is a, a stunt man worked with Chuck Norris. Chuck Norris led him to the Lord. Mm -hmm. He lived in Winter Haven. I found out about him. He went to um, my pastor's church and he did evangelistic work and I invited him. His name is Kevin Terry. And uh, if you look at him from afar, he, he looked like Chuck Norris. And that's why he was one of Chuck Norris' stuntmen. And he was a martial arts, black belt, two or three grades. And he did all kinds of things. He brought this message. He was a good preacher also. And he preached in Spanish. He was a missionary to Mexico for some while. And uh, he brought this message out to the people. Now in Spanish, uh, there's a play of words, ovejita, was little sheep, and viejita, which means old lady. <laughs> it sounds the same, but it's not the same. Now when he was preaching to us, he we're saying that the man caught the, we read it, the ovejita, put it on his shoulders. But then he said in the congregation, the man took the old lady and put him on his shoulders. And he says, everyone rejoiced because the viejita was on his shoulders instead of the ovejita. And so... You really need to learn the difference and change in words sometimes. It makes a connotation. That caught the ear of our people in our church, and they really listened to the message from that point on. I don't know if he did it on purpose or by mistake. I think he did it by mistake. But he was looking around, and oh, he thought. And he said he carrying the old lady on his shoulders, and everybody was rejoicing when he came back with the old lady on his shoulders. But here we find this story that Jesus tells. It may seem foolish to us to leave 99 sheep to go and search for one. Leave 99 sheep and search for one. That one must have been a stubborn, foolish sheep, right? Left on his own. But the shepherd, he said, no, I'm going to leave the 99 because when they're together, they're safe. He says, I'm going after the one. Although he's stubborn, although he's foolish, and although he's wandered off, maybe without even thinking, but he's alone and he's in danger. Now, why was he in danger? See, the predators always seek the stragglers. That's why he was in danger. And so the shepherd, he went after that one because he knew, according to Jesus' story, that the lost sheep was, listen to this, alone. There's nothing worse than feeling alone in this world. And I was just talking to Peter this morning about Brother Linville. I tried to call him. I tried to contact him. I know that Brother Linville, since the loss of his wife, is living alone. I was even thinking of making a trip over to Riverview to see Brother Linville. And uh, Peter made a call and left a message and nothing and all of a sudden we got word that brother Linville 
today he's in an assisted living home here in Tampa. And according to the note that his daughter left, he's doing quite well. And he's accepting visitors. So I'm going to see if I can go and see him. Because since his wife has died, he's felt alone. He's felt alone. It's not good to be alone, folks. It's not good to be alone. It's not good to be in danger. Aren't you glad that you and I were that lost sheep also? And Jesus came after us? Aren't you glad? Aren't you glad that Jesus saved you when he saved you? I am. So you see, God's love for each one of us, he is so great that he seeks each of us out in our time when we're alone. When we're alone spiritually or emotionally, that's when God seeks you out. Amen? That's what the Bible says, and I'd like you to hold this point and look at John chapter 10. John chapter 10. I'd like to relate these verses with you. John chapter 10, verses 1 through 4. This verse, Jesus proclaims that he is the good shepherd. Amen? Jesus is the good shepherd. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbeth up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. But he that entereth in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. Verse 3. To him the porter openeth, and the sheep hear his voice, and he calleth his own sheep, listen to this, by name. Did you know that Jesus knew you? even before you knew him. Isn't that wonderful? And he says, and he leadeth them out. And, we, and when he putteth forth his own sheep, he goeth before them, and the sheep follow him, for they know his voice. I don't know about you, but when I accepted Christ as my Savior at the age of 19, it sort of felt like the weight of the world was taken off of my shoulders. I felt an easiness and a peace that I couldn't explain. I finally found what I had been searching for. And it wasn't anything in the world. It was God through the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Notice what it tells us in John chapter 10 and verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You know, many times, I know I've harpened on this for maybe a month or two now. I believe that in a lot of churches, there's a lot of unsaved people. I believe so. They're on... The membership list, but their name is not written in the Lamb's Book of Life. You say, why do you say that, Pastor? Where are they? Where are they on Sunday morning? They, they darken the door of the church maybe two or three times a year? Where are they? My goodness, we've become more Catholic than Catholic. People are without hope, folks. People are without hope outside of Jesus Christ. Religion is man trying to reach God. But Christianity is God reaching man. That's the big difference. Amen? That's the big difference. Think of this. Christ showed his extra, extraordinary love towards you when he reached down and touched you. And he found you. And he found me. We were that stubborn, 
foolish, wayward sheep that had strayed. And praise the Lord for his extraordinary love towards us. Amen? There should be no greater joy for us than to see others saved in the Lord Jesus Christ. I have a protege of mine, and his name is Carlos Salaverria. He was one of the young men that said that he'd like to be considered to come and help us. And he's got other things in his hands right now. He's making a mission trip right now to Costa Rica. He's in Costa Rica with a group. He has a ministry, a mission endeavor that's called So International. Charlie, I met him when he was just a little kid, about 10 years old, 10 or 11 years old. 12, maybe 12, and uh, I really didn't lead him to the Lord, but he said that I led him to the Lord. The whole fact was this, his grandfather was with me in the van. We were going to a little town outside of the city of Ponce. I was just a young whippersnapper preacher back then. I didn't know a whole lot, but I knew that God saved me and I was serving the Lord the best I could. And uh, we were going to a little town to minister there, do some visiting. And his grandfather came along. He says, I'm gonna bring my grandson. I said, okay, this is Charlie. Hey, Charlie, how you doing? Doing fine, sir. A little squeaky voice. Doesn't have a squeaky voice anymore now. But uh, his grandfather asked me a question. He says, uh, Pastor Clark, he asked me in Spanish. He says, this thing about leading people to the Lord, can you explain that to me? I said, yeah, I'm, I'm driving along the way, why not? So I explained the, how to lead in the verses that I used, and I used the Romans road and so forth. And, and as I was doing that, he says, oh, I understand, so forth. Little did I know that in the back seat, Charlie was listening and Charlie got convicted and Charlie asked Christ to be his savior in her back seat. As a teenager in high school, they, and when I moved back to Puerto Rico as a missionary I, after working under Dr. Schaefer's ministry for three or four years and uh, as an apprenticeship, uh, they joined the work that we started in the carport. They were one of the main families. Charlie came along and Charlie, I invited some preachers from the States bearing precious seed international. They came and preached and gave out Bibles and evangelistic word knocking on doors and in that meeting, Charlie surrendered to preach. Went to Bob Jones University. Got his bachelor's degree. And uh, later got his master's degree. And later he even studied and got his doctorate's degree. Worked as an assistant pastor for many years. And started a couple churches of his own. And started this ministry. Hey folks. You never know who that lost sheep is listening. There are three young people can feel lost. Adults, young adults can feel lost. People outside of Christ, there's no hope. They feel empty. There should be no greater joy for us than to see other people saved in Christ Jesus. Amen? We are, in turn, commanded to seek his sheep also. We should be involved. I don't know about you, but I don't have a pocket here. I hate shirts without pockets. These are the new type of shirts now. They don't have pockets. So I carry my tracks in my pocket. And I try to keep some tracks on me at all times. I keep tracks in my car. I have tracks in all of my suits. I want to be ready. Right. 
when you go to a, a restaurant, when you leave the tip on the table, put a couple, two or three or four dollars, I don't know how big your tips are, but whenever you leave your tips, put them inside a track, leave it out so they'll see the dollar. They'll take that track because the dollars attract them. But you know what? They just might be the track. Amen? That's what it's all about. I've, uh, I've started doing this and Teresa's taken my example. I see wayward people on the streets asking for money. I'll give them a dollar. Every now and then when I have, have a, a dollar on, I can spare, but you know what? I'll put it inside a track. Give the dollar to the person. Don't be stingy. Amen? But give the word also. Let the Lord use you. We are here to seek the lost sheep. I'd like to draw your attention back to Luke chapter 15, and this time we're going to read verses 8 through 10. Jesus spoke of another parable, another little story. He tied two stories in together with one idea, seeking the lost. Amen? Seeking the lost. Notice, verse 8, Neither what woman, having ten pieces of silver, if she lose one piece, doth not light a candle and sweep the house and seek diligently till she find it? And when she hath found it, she calleth her friends and her neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I had lost. Likewise, I say unto you, there is joy in the presence of angels of God over one sinner that repenteth. I didn't know this, but it's good when you study the customs of olden times. And Jesus, again, used things that people understood so that he could relate to them. And we don't understand it because it's not part of our culture. But in Jesus' time, women received 10 silver coins as a wedding gift. That was part of their wedding gift, 10 silver coins. Along with the great monetary value that it had because it was pure silver. Can you imagine pure silver? 10 coins? It's a wedding gift. These coins had a sentimental value to them, very similar to the wedding ring today. You know, have you ever questioned yourself, where did this thing about the wedding ring come out? You never hear anything about that in, in the Bible, right? But it's, it's a custom that we have today, and uh, it's, it's cherished. To me, this is one of my most cherished things, my wedding ring. And... Uh, to, the, to people in Jesus' time, it was those 10 pieces of silver. That was their wedding gift. And to lose one of those coins, that was a big thing. Here this woman, she had her 10 pieces of silver that had been given to her on her wedding date. Not only the monetary value, which was great, but the sentimental value. That's refers to her love gift from uh, uh, on her wedding. And she was so distressed that she lost one of the coins. What did she do? She put a, a, a candle looking for and sweeping and all over the house until she found it. And, oh, what a joy. I have something to tell you. I can relate to that. Two weeks after... Rosa and I were married. If she were here, she'd tell me. Yeah. She doesn't like me to use. Okay, she's going to watch it. <laughs> <laughs> Making up is better, just like you said. <laughs> Two weeks after we were married, my wife enjoys uh, cooking. To her, it's a hobby. It's enjoyable for her. And uh, boy, does she cook. 
my wife's a wonderful cook. And we, her sister was with us. And uh, she took her wedding band off. She put it on the counter there. And all of a sudden, when she was doing her up, she heard the, her wedding band fall on the floor of the kitchen. And you could feel it, you know, when it, you could ding, ding, because we have tile. And then she looked down, couldn't find it. She says, I'll get it after I finish here. I'll sweep it and find it. <clears throat> Lo and behold, she couldn't find it. She told her sister, Ilsa, help me. She's becoming frantic now. I got this just two weeks ago. I don't have my wedding band now. This really happened. And she said, Clark, she confessed to me. I said, oh, uh, I'll get you another one. No, I want that one. I said, well, let me see. I looked in all the corners and little crevices. and I looked underneath the stove and it was so tight to the to the cupboards and so forth, there's nothing that could get under it or side it and so forth. And we have a dishwasher on the other side and it's the same way. I looked there and it's really tight. I mean, there's no way. And uh, as you go out of our kitchen, we have a, a little pantry closet. She opened that, she, she took everything out of the pantry closet on the bottom shelves to see if nothing. And then across the way, uh, in the living room area, she removed the, the, the sofa and the chairs and everything, and her sister helped her. And just beside that is, is uh, the door goes into the garage. She checked that out. Maybe it went underneath the door. Nothing. For days, she was scratching her head. She said, Clark, what can I do? I said, well... The only thing I know what to do is, I'm going to pray. And so I began to pray. I began to pray. And I said, Lord, show me where that wedding band is. And I was just praying. And in my mind, you're not going to believe this. This is how it happens. The Lord spoke to me in my mind. I can't explain it. But he said, look underneath the dishwasher. Underneath the dishwasher, I went to the dishwasher again, and there's no way it could get in. I mean, it was flush to the floor. And flush on the sides, I mean, there's no way that that ring could get underneath the dishwasher. But the Lord blessed, pressed in my mind, look underneath the dishwasher. So I told my wife, I says, I'm going to look underneath the dishwasher. She says, Clark, don't move that. You, there's so much, we've never moved the dishwasher since I bought the house. Don't do that. Are you an electrician? I said, no. <laughs> says, don't do it. I said, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I said, oh, no. He says, well, I guess I'm going to have to call an electrician later on afterwards. Well, I got on my knees and I got on my back because you had to to unscrew those little screws. Amen. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm talking about. And they're, they're in there pretty tight. And, um, I mean, I got them all out. I took the whole bottom part of the dishwasher out and I looked into it. There's nothing but dust. So I got a dust cloth and so forth. Nothing. I said, well, Lord, you said look underneath the dishwasher. And as I was beginning to put the part back, at least I got it real clean for underneath there. <laughs> Hadn't been cleaned in under there since she'd bought the house over 30 years. But when I started to put the part back, I heard this. 
huh? And I looked there, and it seemed I, it was impossible. The wedding band had seemed to have gotten in somewhere or another, and it had jumped on top of a little ledge just underneath the dishwasher, not on the floor. How it got there, only God knows. But I, when, I, when I pulled it out, I said, honey, here it is. And she said, oh, it was like a fiesta. <laughs> a fiesta. Para la la bamba. <laughs> it was like a fiesta. And Ilsa was there, and my wife was there, and I mean, everybody was hugging and so forth. And if that made us happy, imagine how it is in heaven when a soul gets saved. They have a fiesta. That's what they have in heaven. And that's what the Bible says. Just as the angels rejoice, shows, so should we rejoice whenever anyone is found by God and added to his kingdom. Right. Now, my question is this, and I started, <clears throat> I started to think of this when I was preparing this message. You've heard these examples time and again. I hope I've given some light on something that He's, makes you see it a little bit better now. Why is it that in our churches today we're not as joyful as seeing people get saved as in years past? Think about it. Are we really happy? Did you know that this is the main purpose of this church? To get people saved. Reach the lost with the good news of the gospel. Amen? Oh, that God would help us to keep that as the main priority of Temple Heights Baptist Church. Amen. Yes? I don't usually do this, but something wonderful happened today. Amen. And I told several people about it, but I've had the privilege for quite a few years to teach younger kids in Awana, but more recently the teens. Yes. The group I said I would never teach. Yeah. <laughs> but anyway, I love those kids, and I see now one of the reasons why God gave me five sons, because most of the kids are boys. So I relate. And um, we've been going through the book of Ephesians, verse by verse. Amen. It came to the end, and it was talking about the role of the husband mm -hmm. in the family. And I was talking about, you know, how important that was for a Christian man to be in charge and to lead his family in the ways of righteousness. And um, after that lesson that day, a couple of weeks ago, Xavier um, and I were talking, and Xavier has had a relationship with a young woman. They have a little boy. And um, I could tell he was under conviction. I know. Well, he came, he came today, and he said, Mrs. Lewis, he said, I got married. Hallelujah. He said, I got married, and he showed me the video, and his, uh, formerly his fiance's grandfather performed the service. He's apparently an ordained minister. And, um, I was thinking about that the whole time that you were preaching tonight because I think sometimes we can become discouraged, maybe you as a pastor, when you don't see souls saved or when you work with young people or children and you apparently don't see any difference that the teaching of the Word of God is making. You can never underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit yes. in its convicting power. And so um, I'm just rejoicing Amen. Because uh, he said his mother was crying. She's a godly woman. Amen. She raised her children for the Lord, but they have not been following the Lord. And so she was rejoicing. Amen. And um, I just thought about this, this sheep, you know, this one who was found and was 
now knowing what to do. He got, shouldn't leave the flock. He should be with the flock. And so uh, now we want his wife to become, you know, a part of the Amen. congregation also. So it was just a, a wonderful day. And I give God all the credit. Amen. All the credit for that. Amen. Because we've been knowing that boy since he was <laughs> small. And so that's the heritage of Temple Heights Baptist Church. Amen. That he has been around people who love him. People who are concerned about him. People who meet him where he is. I remember going by and picking him up yes. in my car for yes. every service. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I took him home for numerous a lot of meetings, you know, and it was just uh, just a wonderful thing today. Amen. I think we need to give God a hand clap yes. on that one. Amen. <laughs> that is what it's all about. Amen. Seeking the lost getting the good news out of the gospel, seeking that lost coin, seeking that wedding band, and rejoicing when we find it. Amen? Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the joy that we can relate to and uh, the lost sheep and uh, the lost coin and the young people that find their way. And we pray, Lord, that all of our young people that come through the doors here will draw closer to you as we've seen this happen today. Father, we give thee praise for what you're doing and what you're going to do. And as we continue to keep this our main emphasis of our church, seeking the lost with the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Thank you so much for being here. Amen. God bless you. Be safe. Be victorious in the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. amen.